Mitchell Dunier, Ghetto, The Invention of a Place, The History of an Idea. Dive into the intriguing history of the concept of the ghetto and its evolution, as expertly dissected in a ghetto, The Invention of a Place, The History of an Idea by Mitchell Dunier. Through a detailed analysis of the origins of the term and its transformation over time, Dunier's work highlights the societal and political shifts that have shaped the ghettos we know today. Explore the plight of marginalized communities, as the book sheds light on the systemic racism that persists till date. Prepare to be engrossed in this eye-opening journey that delves into centuries of history, socio-political dynamics and the evolution of an idea, the ghetto. Embrace conflict, discover your true self. Embracing conflict can help you become more in tune with your true self and resolve inner conflicts. Avoiding conflict may keep the peace temporarily, but ultimately leads to inner turmoil and greater problems. Learning to resolve conflicts effectively can move you from avoidance to honesty, promoting a healthier, more genuine connection with others. Conflict is a natural part of life, but too often we shy away from it. Cheryl Richardson, a self-care expert, suggests that by avoiding conflict and keeping the peace, you ignite a war within yourself. From childhood, we develop two aspects of our personality, the true self, which is free and authentic, and the strategic self, which adapts to its environment and conforms to societal expectations. As we grow up, these two selves can pull us in different directions, creating inner struggle and a sense that something isn't right. When adult conflicts arise, addressing them directly can bring us closer to our true self. To better understand the choices we face in handling conflict, Picture a conflict box with the name of someone you're in conflict with. There are two main options for addressing the issue, diving in with the truth, option A, or avoiding the conflict altogether, option B. Option A is risky, in the worst case scenario, it could even end the relationship. Option B, keeping the peace, might seem more appealing, but when the truth inevitably surfaces, you'll face three issues, the initial conflict, your inner turmoil, and a new conflict arising from your evasion. This conflict creep pushes option B further into an unhealthy territory. For a more productive approach, take a closer look at the conflict box. Skip row 7, and in row 8, write down your fears about the other person's reaction if you were to tell the truth, such as them blaming or leaving you. In row 9, express how you would feel if these fears were realized, using, I, statements like, I'll feel hurt. Through this exercise, you recognize that by choosing option B, you're really trying to protect yourself from the consequences of speaking up. Thankfully, there's a third option, learning how to resolve conflicts effectively, option C. This alternative empowers you to be your true self while rebuilding connection with others. By mastering the art of conflict resolution, you can transition from option B to option A, shifting from avoidance to honesty, finally embracing your true self and paving the way for more authentic relationships. The Evolution of Ghetto In the early 20th century, the term ghetto transformed from representing legally separated spaces for Jewish people to signifying self-segregated ethnic enclaves where immigrants grouped themselves in impoverished urban areas. German-Jewish author Louis Wirth documented these voluntary neighborhoods in his 1928 book, The Ghetto. The Nazis later adopted the term to denote enclosures where they forcibly held Jews during World War II. Post-war, African Americans began utilizing the word ghetto to describe their urban neighborhoods. Horace Caton and St. Clair Drake, two black University of Chicago graduate students, published a book in 1945 titled Black Metropolis a study of Negro life in a northern city, highlighting the parallels between the Jewish ghettos and the racial segregation experienced by African Americans in Chicago. They referenced white northerners' prejudice against black people and their efforts to maintain black ghettos. Even the University of Chicago's president, Robert Maynard Hutchins, openly supported whites-only neighborhoods and used university funds for their advancement. Caden and Drake drew comparisons between black and Jewish communities, referring to black Americans as America's Jews and likening the experiences of those facing racism and oppression. 
Restrictive Covenants and Racism According to Caden and Drake, restrictive covenants played a key role in perpetuating racism in America. These pacts among white property owners prohibited the sale or rent of their properties to black people, limiting black residency in white neighborhoods to a mere 2%. Even the University of Chicago president, as well as influential real estate organizations like the National Association of Real Estate Boards, supported these racially discriminatory practices. When black families did manage to move into white neighborhoods, they often faced violence and arson without any intervention from law enforcement. Forced into overcrowded and undermaintained areas, black communities experienced severe housing shortages and depreciation, resulting in a vicious cycle of poverty and discrimination. Unraveling Murdahl's American Dilemma Gunnar Murdahl, a Swedish economist and sociologist, authored the 1944 classic, An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem and Modern Democracy. This book became the mid-20th century's go-to reference for understanding racial issues in the United States and even influenced the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Employed by the Carnegie Corporation, Murdahl was chosen for his foreigner's impartial perspective on American race relations. He assembled an exceptional research team, including prominent black academics. Murdahl identified the American dilemma as the cognitive dissonance within white Americans, upholding egalitarian values while neglecting the plight of black citizens. He suggested that exposing the substandard living conditions of black people could be the solution. However, Murdahl's work fell short in addressing systemic racism, as he attributed the problem primarily to Southern prejudice and overlooked the persistent Northern racism fueling anti-black housing discrimination. This gap could have been mitigated by collaborating with Caden, an expert in understanding the complexities of the ghetto. Unfortunately, a collaboration never materialized due to disagreements on equitable working arrangements. The Powerlessness Cycle in the 1940s, psychologist Kenneth Clark's doll experiments revealed a disturbing preference among black children for white dolls, hinting at deep-seated feelings of inferiority due to racial segregation. Clark's 1965 book, Dark Ghetto, Dilemmas of Social Power, expanded upon this notion, coining the term institutionalization of powerlessness to describe the social, economic, political, and educational hardships faced by the black community. This powerlessness was exacerbated by practices like redlining, which allowed white individuals to control and restrict who received loans. Government policies and capitalist developers also played a part in shaping the ghettos, with federal agencies supporting redlining methods that dictated how private lenders operated. Consequently, funds designated for mortgages were redirected, leading to the construction of large public housing projects that embodied social isolation. Black individuals were pushed into these projects, while their former neighborhoods experienced urban regeneration, offering amenities like parks, concert halls, universities, and hospitals. However, these renovations also served as a facade for the systematic relocation of poor, black urban dwellers. Economic prospects within the ghettos were bleak, as black jobs often disappeared during downturns and returned last when the economy recovered. Discriminatory unions and the project's geographic locations, far from metropolitan job hubs, further hindered employment opportunities. Despite Clark's groundbreaking insights, his work had minimal impact on policymakers at the time. Unveiling the Moynihan Misstep During the 1960s, as America struggled to address issues in black communities, the spotlight fell on Democrat Daniel Patrick Moynihan and his controversial report on black family dynamics. President Kennedy tasked Moynihan with drafting the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964, which initiated the War on Poverty. Moynihan's report centered around the supposed decay of black ghettos due to a matriarchal family structure and high rates of illegitimate births. He argued that this damaged family structure led to a growing dependence on welfare and ultimately hindered progress in combating poverty and discrimination. However, the report disregarded the profound effects of systemic white racism and instead focused on victim blaming. In response, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, asserting that the path to black equality should prioritize family strengthening to break the cycle of disadvantage and poverty. 
While considered well-intentioned, Moynihan's viewpoint resulted in overlooking the true issue, structural racism. Fading Importance, Race and Inequality William Julius Wilson, an African-American sociologist, once proclaimed that the most significant social issue in America was economic inequality, even in ghettos. He wrote the controversial book, The Declining Significance of Race, asserting that race-neutral approaches should be used to tackle social issues and that urban deindustrialization was the leading cause of joblessness rather than racial discrimination. However, rather than leading to progressive change, his ideas were co-opted and distorted by political figures who would implement welfare cuts and harsher criminal sentences, perpetuating systemic poverty and racism. Today, those trapped in ghettos are still widely blamed for their plight instead of pointing fingers at the perpetuators and proponents of this unjust system. Having journeyed through the insightful narrative of a ghetto, the invention of a place, the history of an idea, the understanding of the ghetto as an evolving phenomenon becomes clear. Unfortunately, systemic racism and marginalization continue to impact these communities, as our society remains interwoven with prejudices and inequalities. The varied representations of the ghetto over time, and in our present era, reflect the deeper socio-political issues that we must confront together. Mitchell Dunier's work serves not only as a comprehensive historical account, but also as a call to acknowledge, challenge, and address the harmful effects of social divisions and inequalities in our world.